Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are going to be reading some articles out of History Magazine and all of them are going to be about various indigenous peoples of North America. These articles were chosen by some of my channel mem members. <laughs> by some of my channel members, including Nebulous Wisp, Mark, and Marta. So, thank you so much. If you would like to choose a History Magazine article for the next video, you can click the Join button right down there, or check the link in the description box to become a channel member. It is only 99 US cents per month and you get all kinds of little goodies like behind the scenes, upcoming things, uh, you get your own emojis in the live chat, and you get a shout out at the start of every video. So, if you're interested in that, it's just right down there, but let's get into it. We're going to go chronologically, so we're actually going to start with, it gets in this issue, we're going to start off with the Mayans. Let's go to find the article first. It's in the very back. Here we go. About the Mayans. In particular, we are going to read about the Mayan city of Palenque, which the, the channel member was Nebulous because they had never heard of Palenque. So let's read all about it. My city of the gods. Deep in the jungle in Mexico state of Chiapas stands in the ruins of a Maya city. Stands the ruins of a Maya city known today as Palenque. Surrounded by a thick canopy of cedar and mahogany, some 1,500 individual structures make up the ancient complex, whose center is dominated by a palace and ringed by temples. Although Palenque is relatively small compared with other Maya sites such as Chichen Itza or Tikal, the fine detail and elegance of its architecture has stunned visitors since its 7th century heyday. The slender walls of its monuments were once coated with a layer of stucco and painted with brilliant reds and blues. Although these colors have long faded, Palenque's ornate friezes and stonework endured. So too has its rich repository of inscriptions, most notably on the panels of the city's largest stepped pyramid, known as the Temple of the Inscriptions. As historians sift through Palenque's visual treasures and decode the intricacies of its glyphs, they have learned how the city's ruling dynasty, architecture, and faith were all bound together. They reflected the beliefs of the wider Maya world, while also proclaiming Palenque's own distinctive religious traditions and gods. City Origins Maya is a 20th century term for the civilization that flourished across southern Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and modern-day Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. It flourished during what scholars called its classic period from the years 250 to 900. Maya civilization was hegemonic, hegemonic? and consisted of numerous independent power centers unified by common languages, calendars, and a system of writing, as well as religious rituals and customs. Palenque belonged to this network. Despite these connections, these sites often were in conflict with each other. Palenque was no exception. The name Palenque comes from a Spanish word meaning stockade, the name was initially given by 16th century Spanish settlers to a nearby town, which over time became associated with the ruins themselves. 
Today, some historians believe the people of Palenque may have known the city as La Camha. A Maya word related to rivers and reflecting the place's abundant sources of water. Palenque's first inhabitants likely settled the site around the first century BCE. As the city grew, it prospered enough to later assert its influence over other peoples in the region. Palenque grew wealthy from trade, as well as from tributes collected from subjugated cities. Like other Maya cities, Palenque was ruled by an official known as an Ajaw. The position has been compared to a king, but many scholars liken it more to that of a powerful governor or lord. The title seems to have been hereditary, with power passing from fathers to sons. The Ajaw served as a link between the gods and the people. Glyphic inscriptions found at Palenque revealed that the people believed the gods controlled the weather. The city's mysterious mist and storms could both disrupt and drive the agriculture on which the city depended. It was the Ajaw's role to intercede with the gods to help protect and feed his people. Around the year 431, Palenque's ruling dynasty was founded by a leader named Kukpalam I. Palenque would reach new heights a couple centuries later in the 7th century when its greatest Ajaw, Pakal the Great, came to power. Known as Gnich Janab Pakal, meaning sun face shield, he became Ajaw when only a child, and his mother, Lady Sakuk, ruled as regent until he came of age. He held power from 615 until his death in 683, at about 80 years of age. During his reign, Pakal transformed Palenque from relative obscurity into a city that rivaled other great Maya cities such as Tikal. Palaces and Temples Pakal city was divided into two areas, a central public area, the great plaza surrounded by monuments, and a separate residential zone. The sophisticated city had aqueducts, public squares, and recreational ball courts. Civil power was focused on the great palace. Other structures had stood on the same site in previous eras, but this soaring structure dominated by its four-story tower was built in Pakal's time. We're going to look at the other pictures after, don't worry. The impressive temple of the inscriptions was begun during Pakal's reign. This remarkable stepped pyramid is a classic example of Maya architecture featuring nine distinct levels crowned by a temple with an iconic Maya roof comb at the top. The building's greatest treasures, perhaps, are the detailed glyphs and images inscribed on its walls. These markings record the history of Palenque and its people, providing valuable insight into the culture, beliefs, rituals, and the worldview of Palenque's residents. One account depicts a destructive invasion carried out before Pakal's time. The forces of Kalakmul, a Maya city deep in the jungle of the Paten Basin to the east, attacked the city. The accounts describe the onslaught in dramatic terms, recounting the widespread destruction that swept through the city. The inscriptions recount how the Kalakmul had thrown down the principal deities of the city, but Pakal restored the gods, returning them to their rightful places of worship. Pakal constructs a narrative that placed him at the center as a savior who restored divine order to the city and its people. The deities that Pakal restored were three gods closely bound to Palenque's identity. Known as the Palenque Triad, scholars have dubbed them G1, G2, and G3. 
Their exact nature is complex, each with multiple functions and often interrelated to other Maya gods worshipped in other cities. Three more structures in Palenque were erected to strengthen ties with the gods. Bacal's son and heir, Knich Kamp Alam, which means shining snake jaguar, began work on a new ritual landscape south of the palace and temple complex built by his father. Known collectively as the Cross Group, the complex was built in the 8th century. It consists of the Temple of the Cross, the Temple of the Foliated Cross, and the Temple of the Sun. The complex's name comes from the resemblance of temple motifs to a cross. In fact, they are iterations of the Maya world tree, a central connecting factor in Maya cosmology. Each of the three temples is connected to a god in the Palenque Triad. The Temple of the Cross is associated with G1, the Temple of the Foliated Cross with G2, and the Temple of the Sun with G3. Of these gods, it is perhaps G2 that is best understood by archaeologists, thanks to inscriptions, images on censers discovered in the Temple of the Foliated Cross, and reliefs. His name is Unen Kawil, the infant, associated with maize and rain. Inscriptions bind the infant G2 to the ideas of dynastic fertility and to the legitimacy of Palenque's rulers. Temples and Tombs The first Europeans to see these ruins gazed on them in the 1600s. They were amazed by their beauty. In the subsequent centuries, more visitors traveled to Palenque to observe these buildings and record their magnificent artworks. The first modern archaeological studies began in the 20th century. The work of Mexican archaeologist Alberto Ruz was among the most important. Working in the 1950s, he made a significant find in the Temple of the Inscriptions. He recorded that a chamber located at the lowest part of the temple resembled an abandoned chapel Across the walls, stucco figures processed in relief. The floor was almost entirely filled with a great carved stone slab. The body under the slab, covered with a jade death mask wearing a pen penetrating gaze, was identified as Pakal, laid to rest there after his death in 683. The magnificent sarcophagus lid, inscribed with Maya glyphs and elaborate imagery centering on a crouched figure, became the source of widespread fascination. Mayanists assert the likely interpretation is that the figure is Pakal, posed before the Maya world tree. In the tomb, his body was surrounded by jade objects, whose green color symbolizes maize and water the materials on which Maya civilization rested. Some of the tomb's objects were dusted with cinnabar, an ore of oxidized mercury, whose red color represents blood, life, and the afterlife. Stability continued into the reign of Pakal's grandson and beyond, but by the mid-800s, Palenque's influence in the region started to falter. By 900, Palenque would be empty, believed to be part of what scholars call the Maya Collapse, an as-yet unexplained abandonment of the great urban centers of the empire. Palenque's buildings would stand strong as their vivid colors faded over time. Uncovered centuries later, Palenque's monuments continue to proclaim their people's past glory. Archaeologists are continuing to explore these. In the 1990s, a passageway hidden under the stairs of Temple 13 was found to lead to another tomb of a highborn woman, now known as the Red Queen. She is believed to be Lady Tsukabu Acha, Pakal's queen consort. 
a team of archaeologists led by Arnoldo Gonzalez in 2016 announced the discovery of a water tunnel under the Temple of the Inscriptions and Bacal's tomb. They believe the tomb and pyramid were deliberately placed on top of a spring so that the water would provide Bacal's spirit a way to travel to the underworld. I like this picture up here because it shows what these pyramids would have looked like in their heyday when they were painted all these beautiful colors. And this is a really cool statue, my goodness. It's supposed to represent the a jaw, but it looks like, I don't know, it looks like a, <laughs> it looks like one of the Skeksis from Dark Crystal, if you know what I mean. It's a little eerie to me. See, I want to see. This is um, the slab above Bacall's tomb. And here's what it would have looked like all colored in. Very beautiful. And then I really want to show you this map. The Palenque Complex. So let's see. We have the Temple of the Cross. The Temple of the Foliated Cross. Then, right here is the Temple of the Sun. Then we have number four is Temple 19. This is Temple 20. This big building here is the Great Palace. This is the Temple of the Inscriptions. We have number eight, the Tomb of the Red Queen. This is the Temple of the Skull. They didn't talk about that. That sounds a little ominous. This is Temple 11. And this building here is Temple 10. This is the Temple of the Count. I wonder what that means. Maybe like a calendar thing. And here's the North Group. So these are the, this is the Northern Zone southwestern zone and the cross group up here and you can see this is just the heart of what was a sprawling city all around all throughout the jungle very very cool so we look at this first picture here it says that this is the great palace that we saw in the diagram and the temple of the inscriptions and that was the Red Queen's tomb, so on and so forth. How cool is that? But let's move a little bit farther north, a little bit farther into history. Talk about the Aztec people. I think. looks Aztec to me. We'll look at all these pictures too after we do, of course. Really long article. There we go. Rise and fall of the Aztec. And my my apologies for any mispronunciations. I'm doing my best as an American that doesn't speak Nahuatl. Following the fall of Tenochtitlan, an Aztec poet composed a searing account of the capture of the capital city, written in the Nahuatl language using the Latin alphabet of the Spanish invaders. It is the earliest native account of the sufferings of the Aztec people and their defeat 500 years ago in 1521. Our inheritance, our city, is lost and dead. The shields of our warriors could not save it. We have chewed dry twigs and salt grasses. We have eaten lizards, rats, and worms. Today, what remains of Tenochtitlan lies underneath Mexico's thriving capital, Mexico City, one of the most populous cities in the world. Surrounded by modern architecture, the archaeological site of Templo Mayor is revealing more and more about the Aztec city and its inhabitants. 
a reminder of the people and culture who were subdued and absorbed by the colony of New Spain. Many European chroniclers focused attention on the conquistador Hernán Cortés, but renewed focus on the events of 1521 is placing more attention on the Aztec themselves. What has unfolded is a compelling, complex story of how an alliance among Mesoamerican city-states quickly rose to power, only to lose it. There's a map you can see here, the lands of the Aztec. There's the, the capital here, the Valley of Mexico. Colorful Chronicles The name Aztec was first coined by an outsider. The Aztec called themselves the Mexica, or Cujua Mexica. In the early 1800s, German scientist and explorer Alexander von Humboldt coined the term for the people of Tenochtitlan based on the word Aztlan, the traditional name of the Mexica's ancestral homeland. Archaeologists have not been able to identify the exact location of Aztlan, but most place it in northern Mexico. Much of what is understood about Mesoamerica during the time of the Aztec comes from either sources written by the Mexica themselves or by the Spanish after 1519. The region was rich with other cultures and city-states, but more is specifically known about Aztec culture because of these plentiful sources. The Mexica portray themselves in their records as a people predestined for power, who, after overcoming numerous obstacles, eventually control a wide-ranging empire. These accounts were created by the Mexica in recorded histories known as codices. They took note of their ancestors, their deeds, their faith, and their practices in these documents. Many were destroyed during the Spanish invasion, but five survived. These were pillaged by the Spanish and sent to Europe, where they are now held in several museums. Production of such works resumed after Tenochtitlan's fall. Some were commissioned by Spanish colonists as a means to better understand and control the Mesoamerican peoples. One of the most famous is the Mendoza Codex, which was created in 1542 for Charles V, King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor. The document features Aztec glyphs accompanied by texts written in Spanish, allowing for translation. The first part of the Codex lists a series of wars or conquests grouped by each Aztec leader. The second part lists the tributes received. There's a picture of it coming up later. In addition to tributes, the Aztec state enriched itself through trade. Much of what historians know about the Triple Alliance is drawn from the tributary codices of Tenochtitlan. Although the picture is incomplete, no record of this type has been found concerning Texcoco or Tlacopan. The sources provide a fascinating window into how the huge population between 150,000 and 300,000 of Tenochtitlan were provisioned. Food, raw materials, and fabrics came from areas close to the city, while luxuries such as gold, sweet gum resin, cocoa, and precious feathers came from distant corners of the sprawling empire. Okay. Centers of power. There we go. The people of Aztlan were originally nomadic and had migrated to several locations before settling on the islands of Lake Texcoco in the Valley of Mexico, which was controlled by the nearby city of Atz Atzcapotzalco. The Mexica served as mercenaries and built a reputation for ferocity in combat. They spoke Nahuatl, the same tongue of the mighty Toltec civilization who dominated the region between the 10th and 12th centuries, and sought to connect to their illustrious ancestors. Around 1325, the Mexica founded Tenochtitlan and made it their capital. 
Although the new city prospered, along with other cities, including Tashkoko, it remained subject to Atska Potsalko until the lord of Atska Potsalko died in the early 15th century. As disputes arose over his successor, the dominion of Atska Potsalko ended. In 1428, a new power emerged, formed by the cities of Tenochtitlan, Teshkoko, and Tlacopan. It was called the Triple Alliance. At first, Teshkoko and Tenochtitlan occupied the top of the hierarchy, with Tlacopan subordinate to both of them. Over time, Tenochtitlan became the most powerful, and its ruler, Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, or just Moctezuma II, was the most powerful member of the Federation in the 1500s when the Spanish arrived. They observed that Moctezuma's people were the most powerful of the Chippewa Alliance, and put forth the idea of an empire centered around the Mexica one which later became widely known as the Aztec Empire. In the early 1400s, the Triple Alliance took control of Azcapotzalco and other subject peoples. Some willingly accepted this transition of power, but others had to be convinced by force. There was no major expansion of territory until a great famine occurred in the Valley of Mexico between 1450 and 1454. The Alliance needed more land for food production and began conquests of city-states. This process accelerated under Ashai Katl, the Tlatuani, or ruler of Tenochtitlan, the de facto ruler of the Alliance. Although often translated as king or emperor, the role of Tlatuani was less absolute in nature and required multifaceted leadership. He actively intervened in the army, state religion and governing, as a kind of commander-in-chief and head priest rolled into one. Other powerful city-states remained independent from, though not necessarily hostile to, Tenochtitlan's domination. Tlaxcala, which lay fairly close to Tenochtitlan, was a major center of active resistance. Historians are divided as to whether the Tlaxcalan people remained independent through military strength or convenience. Mexica sources justified leaving it alone because it left a nearby state available for important ritual warfare contests known as the Flower Wars, in which inconclusive battles provided a source of prisoners to sacrifice to the gods. The fact that the Tlaxcalan allied with the Spanish against Tenochtitlan, however, seems to contradict that account. In 1521, the city-state became Hernán Cortés's local ally in his campaign against Moctezuma. Building an Empire In 1481, Ashai Katzel was succeeded as Tlatuani by his brother Tizoc, whose reign is celebrated on the huge sacrificial Stone of Tizoc. Carved reliefs show him subduing 15 cities. His short reign saw revolts against his regime and gained limited territory. Even so, power was still dramatically proclaimed through such impressive monuments. Ahuizotl, probably the greatest of all the Aztec rulers, came to power next. Here's the card, it's easier. He expedited the empire's borders as far as present-day Guatemala coming into contact with Maya lands. When Ahuitzotl died in 1502, Moctezuma II became Tlatuani and expanded the alliance's influence significantly into the Zapotec areas toward the Pacific. He was still ruling when Cortes made his fateful landing and founded the colony of Veracruz on April 22, 1519. War was not the only means by which the alliance expanded. 
city-states and their lands could be gained through diplomacy and inheritance. The death of a lord of a dominion within the alliance's territory was an opportunity. A tense succession process would soon follow. If a candidate resisted the alliance's power, he could be replaced by a close relative more amenable to the Mexica. Putting him in control of a local territory allowed the Aztec to accumulate more power. This system led to the creation of complex power networks within the alliance. One local lord might be subject to the overlord of Tenochtitlan, while others might be subject to those of Texcoco or Tlacopan. Despite these complexities, the Triple Alliance was able to grow quickly over the course of a few decades. However, it was these kinds of struggles that contributed to Tenochtitlan's fall. Problems arose when several candidates had the same relationship with the overlord, and he had to choose among them. This happened shortly before the arrival of Cortes, when Neza Hualpili, lord of the second most important city of the Texcoco Empire, died. Three potential successors all had mothers who belonged to the aristocracy of Tenochtitlan. Moctezuma, therefore, had to reject two factions and risk alienating them, which is exactly what happened. One of the rejected candidates, um, Ixtlili Xochitl, later formed an alliance with the Spanish. Alienation and local rivalries were factors in the fall of Tenochtitlan. In the face of the invading Spanish, the city-states of Mesoamerica chose different paths to survival. Some, like Tlaxcala, chose to ally with Spain, while others, like the Mexica, chose to fight. As the world revisits the events of 1521, much remains to be explored about the story of the Mexica and their fate when Spain came to the Americas. So yeah, here's a picture of well, at least one of the codices. I'm not sure which one it is. It was the one they were talking about. Yes, the one made for Charles V. Very interesting. Another one about the tributes here. That's really cool. And let's look back at the pictures before we move to the last article. Engraving here. Conquest. Big tower here. Big temple. This is in Mexico City. Old, old temple. It's a more modern looking painting. The map. Let's move to the last article. This one's a little bit different um, than this one. It talks more about the artifacts that these people left behind more than the actual people, but we're gonna move up way farther north than the Aztecs and talk about some of the indigenous people that live in what's now Alaska, Treasures of Nunalik, Threat of the Thaw. a really thick page, I guess so. Yeah. Here we go. The archaeological site of Nulek on the southwest coast of Alaska preserves a fateful moment, frozen in time. The muddy square of earth is full of everyday things that the indigenous Yupik people used to survive and to celebrate life here all left just as they lay when a deadly attack came almost four centuries ago. As is often the case in archaeology, a tragedy of long ago is a boon to modern science. Archaeologists have recovered 100,000 artifacts at Nunalek, from typical eating utensils to extraordinary things such as wooden ritual masks, ivory tattoo needles, pieces of finely calibrated sea kayaks, and a belt of caribou teeth. 
Beyond the sheer quantity and variety, the objects are astonishingly well preserved, having been frozen in the ground since about 1660. The ground's frigid state even preserved rare organic material such as grass ropes, salmonberry seeds, head lice, and grass strands woven into baskets. This grass was cut when Shakespeare walked the earth, observed lead archaeologist Rick Necht of the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Land of the Yupik Archaeologists believe the Yupik people's ancestors originated in eastern Siberia and Asia. They first crossed the Bering Sea to North America around 10,000 years ago and gradually moved into the coastal areas of western Alaska. Around the year 1400, communities moved up the coastal rivers, including the Yukon, to form settlements farther inland. Rather than the frigid northern lands of what is now Alaska, the climate in these areas was milder. The waterways supplied the Yupik with food, from the shore or within their kayaks, hunters used harpoons or bows and arrows to catch salmon and hunt mammals. During the year, people would travel to different seasonal camps to harvest different food sources. In the colder months, they would shelter in structures made out of earth. It was around the perimeter of what was once one of these large sod structures that Necht and his team of archaeologists made an astonishing find. They uncovered traces of a centuries-old fire that was used to smoke out the residents. Some fifty people, probably an alliance of extended families, who lived here when they weren't out hunting, fishing, and gathering plants. No one, it seems, was spared. Archaeologists unearthed the remains of someone, likely a woman, who appears to have succumbed to smoke inhalation as she tried to dig an escape tunnel under a wall. Skeletons of women, children, and elders were found together, face down in the mud, suggesting that they were captured and killed. Necht sees a link between the destruction at the site and the old tales that the modern Yupiks remember. Oral tradition preserves memories of a time historians call the Bow and Arrow Wars days, when Yupik communities fought one another in bloody battles some time before Russian explorers arrived in Alaska in the 1700s. Nunalik offers the first archaeological evidence and the first firm date for this frightful period, which affected several generations of Yupik. Necht believes the attacks were the result of climate change, a 550-year chilling of the planet now known as the Little Ice Age, that coincided with Nunalik's occupation. The coldest years in Alaska in the 1600s must have been a desperate time, with raids probably launched to steal food. Whenever you get rapid change, there's a lot of disruption in the seasonal cycles of subsistence, says Necht. If you get an extreme, like the Little Ice Age, or like now, changes can occur faster than people can adjust. Retreating Ice for centuries, Yupik people on both sides of the Bering Sea have made the Arctic tundra their home, but today unpredictable and increasingly violent weather has not only thrown off the rhythm of subsistence hunting cycles, it has also driven Nunalek to the brink of oblivion. In summer, everything looks fine as the land dons its perennial robe of white flowering yarrow and springs of cotton grass that light up like candles when the morning sun hits the tundra. The scene turns alarming come winter, when the Bering Sea hurls vicious storms at the coast. If the waves were big enough, they crash across a narrow gravel beach and rip away at the remains of the site.
in Quinhagak, the modern Yupik village just four miles from Nunalek. Changes brought by the weird weather are a common topic of conversation. Twenty years ago, the elders began to say the ground was sinking, says Warren Jones, president of Kanutsuk, the Yupik corporation that owns and manages the community's property. The past ten years or so, it's been so bad everybody's noticed. We're boating in February. That's supposed to be the coldest month of the year. The Arctic wasn't always like this, but global climate change is now hammering Earth's polar regions. The result is a disastrous loss of artifacts from little-known prehistoric cultures, like the one at Nunalek, all along Alaska's shores and beyond. Massive thaws exposing traces of past peoples and civilizations across the northern regions of the globe from Neolithic bows and arrows in Switzerland to hiking staffs from the Viking Age in Norway and lavishly appointed tombs of Scythian nomads in Siberia. So many sites are in danger that archaeologists are beginning to specialize in the rescue of once frozen artifacts. In coastal Alaska, archaeological sites are now threatened by one-two punch. The first blow? Average temperatures that have risen more than 3 degrees Fahrenheit in the past half century. As one balmy day follows another, the permafrost is thawing almost everywhere. When archaeologists began digging at Nunalek in 2009, they hit frozen soil about 18 inches below the surface of the tundra. Today the ground is thawed 3 feet down. That means masterfully carved artifacts of caribou antler, driftwood bone, driftwood bone and walrus ivory are emerging from the deep freeze that has preserved them in perfect condition. If not rescued, they immediately begin to deteriorate. The knockout blow. Rising seas. Since 1900, the global level of oceans has risen about 8 inches a figure that experts believe will continue to increase. It's a direct threat to coastal sites such as Nunalek, which is doubly vulnerable to... These pages are thick. Doubly vulnerable to wave damage now that the thawing permafrost is making the land sink. One good winter storm and we could lose this whole site, says Nick. He speaks from experience. Since the start of the excavation, the relentless action of the sea has torn about 35 feet from the edge of the site. The winter after the 2010 dig was particularly brutal. Residents of Quinhagak remember huge chunks of ice slamming into the coast. By the time Necht and his crew returned, the entire area they had excavated was gone. Since then, the sense of urgency has only increased. Archaeology's potential to inspire an appreciation for the past is what motivated Jones to start the dig. When wooded artifacts began washing up on the beach, he invited Necht to assess the eroding site, then helped to convince the village's board of directors that excavating Nunalek was a good idea. Their meeting grew into a unique collaboration in which the community and the visiting archaeologists work as partners. Jones is proud of the partnership that made this possible. He also looks forward to more discoveries at the site and sees a promising future for the center. I want our kids who are in college now to run the center and to be proud that it's ours. Look at this picture here of the coastline. You can just see how it's been ripped away by the storms. My goodness. And just imagine that this is like a, a site full of information about that warring time they were talking about and it's just completely gone. Very terrifying. There's a cool map on this page of all of the archaeological sites in Alaska. All of the... Let me see. Where's the key? I'm covering it up. 
Okay, all the little dots you see are archaeological sites. So there's Nunalek right there. The blue that you see is the land that's vulnerable to storm surge. So all through here, all up there. And then even more terrifying, there's a map of the Arctic area of the world. And um, all of the light purple you see is the permafrost in 1900. You can see it stretching all the way down. And in 2100, it's the dark purple. So that's what the permafrost is expected to be. So all of this purple will melt and expose all of the artifacts that could be frozen in there, which is interesting, but also like, um, you know, scary for the planet, right? That's a lot of ice melting. And then there's a really cool mask here. It says it's a half man, half walrus. You can see his tusks right there. That's really cool. But we are going to end it there for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I do hope that you have a good, 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 good night. Good night.